I'm Richard Garriott, known to some of you as Lord British, the creator of the Ultima series. This is a story about a game, a game that promised it all, from a legendary developer who had built up trust with his fans for over a decade. The grandfather of the industry, the man who in some ways gave birth to some of the most popular game genres and mechanics still used to this day. It's a game that he promised to participate in together with his fans. All he needed was their support. Their money, of course. He would deliver an experience unlike anything that existed, a game to shake up the stale MMORPG genre and bring it back to its roots. Instead, players were left disappointed and tens of millions of dollars that they pledged to create this dream was wasted. This story has a beginning, a middle, and the end is still being written. But let's go back to the start. Please, join us on this adventure. Please consider backing our project. Together, we will forge a new world. Richard Garriott is, well, he's an interesting man, to put it politely. You might have heard the name Lord British before. Well, that's Richard Garriott, or at least what he likes to be called. Born in England to two American parents, making him a dual citizen by birth, Richard's dad, Owen, was a NASA astronaut. Richard grew up wanting to follow in his father's footsteps. Instead, he was diagnosed with a vision issue at the age of 13, which essentially killed any possibility of making it into the program. At this point, Richard fell back on another passion, fantasy. He'd been exposed to the many brilliant worlds of fiction as an avid reader, the works of Tolkien being one of his all-time favorites, and with the rise of Dungeons and Dragons bringing that interactive element, he was hooked. In 1975, Richard was exposed to computers while attending high school, which immediately sparked his creativity. He convinced his school to allow him to create a programming course, one he would direct himself with the sole purpose of creating video games. Throughout high school, Richard claims to have created 28 or more video games, essentially by himself. And this is what they looked like back then. Now it's time to battle a dragon. How am I going to do that? Which is a pretty far cry from what we see being released in the modern era. This didn't turn out to be a phase, as five years later in 1979, Richard was still working hard and still creating games. This time though, they had graphics. Oh, I fell down a level. I fell down a trapdoor that does reduce your health up by a little bit. A literal game changer. This added an element to his games that were previously missing, and the boss of his summer job at Computerland recognized that fact. He convinced Richard to sell copies of the game as it was truly unlike anything else that existed. Richard spent $200 to bag up copies of the game, along with artwork made by his mother, and started to sell them. Unfortunately, only 12 copies were ever purchased. But one of those 12 made its way to California Pacific Computer Company, and they were very impressed. So much so, they signed a deal with the fresh out of high school genius, which saw over 30,000 copies sold and $150,000 in Richard's pocket. Adjusted for inflation, that's about $600,000 today. Richard had just earned more than three times his father's astronaut salary, and this was just the very beginning. His game, Akalabeth, is considered the first ever computer role-playing game that was published. He then entered the University of Texas and continued to develop video games to continue honing his craft. This time with the Ultima series. The games, however, were becoming so popular that it left him completely unable to focus on school. So he left in order to pursue full-time launching of games just as he finished Ultima 2 in the early 1980s. At this stage, Richard and his small group of friends were responsible for some of the earliest known RPG video games and constantly innovating and pushing boundaries on what was thought to be possible during the evolution of early computing. Each new piece of technology released would see Richard testing it and his sole purpose was to enrich the worlds he was creating for his growing fanbase of role-playing game connoisseurs. It was Richard, his brother, his father and another man by the name of Chuck. They created their own video game publisher, Origin Systems. 
Prior to this, they were relying on third-party companies, but they were burned on Ultima 2's release and decided to take matters in their own hands for Ultima 3. A couple years later in 1992, Electronic Arts approached with an offer of $30 million to purchase Origin Systems, an offer that was quickly accepted. This not only made the Garriots incredibly rich from something they created mostly out of passion, but also gave them the funding to go where no man had gone before, to take the Ultima series and role-playing games to the very next level, where previously the budget of each Ultima game was essentially unpaid labour of those creating it, the next game had a budget on EA's dime of $2.5 million. Which sounds like a terribly small sum of money in today's video game market, but back then was a ridiculous amount. Richard had by this point seen the beginning of a new trend in the RPG genre, one that he hadn't created. It was called the Graphical Multi-User Dungeon, commonly referred to as MUD, examples being the AOL version of Neverwinter Nights and Meridian 59. These games took place on the internet, another new technology that Richard was keen to explore. The internet was an insane evolution, much like that of introducing graphics to text-only games, as Richard had been the pioneer of more than a decade before. This time, they were adding players in a shared world, and Richard saw the possibility of what he could do with that formula, as well as where he could improve it. The idea was pitched to EA, and Ultima Online was now greenlit. It was very important to us that Ultima Online be a game with a theme, and a story, and quest, and then support larger, grander activities. We don't want it to just be player controlled and dominated, we want it to be an Ultima experience, with all the qualities that people expect from that. Ultima Online will be, I believe, the very first ever completely virtual world for the mass public to go live out alternate lives in. With a development time of just over one year from 1995 to 1996, Ultima Online was already seeing massive praise from the early participants of alpha testing. Unsurprisingly, it wasn't like anything seen before. In current day, when someone announces a game with features that sound unrealistic, we can and usually do call them out. We know enough due to historically what has been possible, whether something sounds reasonable. We have access to unprecedented amounts of information, so we are surprised less often than ever before. Back then though, in 1997, people had no idea what to expect because it had just never existed before. The concept of a shared world that you could access from anywhere on the planet, playing with thousands of other humans, owning houses, crafting, gathering materials, fighting players for control of territories, it was completely unfathomable. But within six months of launch, over 100,000 people had already subscribed to the game for a monthly dollar fee. The popularity of his creation and what he did was absolutely legendary. The man who is credited for the first ever published RPG had now launched the revolutionary game Ultima Online and given it a name, an MMORPG, massively multiplayer online role-playing game. A name that sticks with the genre to this day, over 25 years later. Shortly after Meteoric success and in the year 2000, Richard resigned from Origin Systems, his company that was now owned by EA. Once his non-complete expired a year later, he moved to do business with his Korean competitor, NCSoft. While Richard had been birthing a genre in the West, NCSoft had been doing the exact same in Asia with their MMORPG titled Lineage. NCSoft had headhunted this man and they wanted him to do for them what he did for EA. They gave him a massive budget and free reign to develop his dream MMORPG with current technology. This was the next chapter in thus far an incredible legacy. For the next seven years, Richard Garriott developed his dream, a mix between his love of RPGs and his first love, space. An alien power has awakened in some of us. Over time, it's changing us, evolving us but change is what we need. The game titled Tabula Rasa was a complete dud. The video game industry was now flourishing and had moved on to bigger and better things. The MMORPG genre had behemoth titles like World of Warcraft by Blizzard Entertainment, and these were dominating player attention, transcending what was thought to be possible. Tabula Rasa was an aged product even prior to launch and did nothing much to refine the formula. Within the year of launch, Richard Garrett and NCSoft parted ways. This time, Richard was regressing to his prior life goals. He now wanted to go to space, not as a NASA astronaut, but as a private and incredibly wealthy citizen. 
This venture from Earth to the International Space Station cost Richard $30 million. This made him the second ever second generation man in space, being that his father had also made the trip. Upon return, Garriott continued his civil lawsuit against NCSoft for their handling of his employment, a case that he won, awarded $28 million, essentially paying off his entire space adventure. With cash in hand, goals accomplished, and a newfound independence, he was now faced with infinite options. He was already an accomplished man, he could leave it all behind. Already a pioneer, literally going where almost no man went before, creating things that brought joy to millions of people's lives, and cementing his name in history in multiple industries. But the man who created that legacy did so with an attitude to never give up. Yes, his reputation had taken a hit from Tabula Rasa, but that could partially be blamed on NCSoft's part in the development, which by accounts was very troublesome. Could he really let this be the end of his saga? In 2009, still in between decisions, Richard Garriott and longtime business partners formed a new company called Portalarium. This company originally dabbled in creating games for Zynga to launch on the Facebook gaming marketplace until the entire marketplace crashed a few years later. At this point, he made another life-changing decision. Richard Garriott would return to the past, back to Ultima. He was going to bring the legendary title into the future, or at least enough of the feeling and features to be considered a direct successor, but without the name. The company Portalarium was now repurposed, and with it came a promise. Lord British had returned, and with him, the future of massively multiplayer online role-playing games would be changed forever. And I, as Lord British, will be with you in the game, and together we will forge this new world. I would like to invite you to join me and our team on the grand adventure of creating the next great role-playing game. As a modern reincarnation of what made your Avatar's adventures so compelling for the last few decades, I invite you to join us in the creating of Shroud of the Avatar. The Kickstarter launched on March 8th, 2013, asking for a modest sum of $1 million US. The project trailer featured the man, the myth, the legend himself, describing what to expect from what he called the next great role-playing game. Fans from around the world immediately started paying attention. After all, this man created what many to this day still consider one of the greatest innovations in the industry. Not just that, but a game that has never truly been replicated in thought and feeling. How could they not give this man another chance? Especially when the alternative was to play the latest AAA MMORPG created entirely for a casual audience and without much of the flair or flavour of worlds Richard Garriott had spent the last 40 years creating. As for Richard himself, he arrived just in time. People were desperate for new games and Kickstarter had provided an avenue for those games to be created. Finally, players could finance ideas themselves and break their tether to whatever corporations willed for them to consume. So the pitch was simple, change the status quo. Role-playing games, in Richard's words, had focused too much on the level grinding and not enough on the role-playing. The worlds looked better, they sounded better, but they were too linear, too closed. No longer did players live in the world, participating in an immersive experience, Instead, they performed tasks, checked boxes on a list, and largely shared an identical experience to one another. Shroud of the Avatar would go back to when this was not the case. You would choose a role to play, an adventurer, an explorer, a trader, a crafter, a gatherer, all with branching paths of gameplay, deep enough to satisfy and wide enough to remain interesting for years to come. Not only that, but a world full of consequences, as choice becomes meaningless without. On a technical level, promises were made. A fully interactive world, meaning if you see anything, it will do something. A deep original fiction created alongside prolific writer Tracy Hickman. Not only that, but an option to experience the game anywhere with a solo or offline game mode function. All the features included classless character systems, giving players the freedom required to navigate an open experience and change their mind as they do, player housing in a persistent open world giving land value and prestige, deep crafting, a player-driven economy, meaningful player versus player, and much, much more. The campaign saw immediate buzz, not just from potential backers, but industry professionals and media outlets. 
while not everyone supported crowdfunding, it was a relatively new frontier and it was impossible to follow the industry and not be curious about where it would go, especially with such a prestigious, experienced leader at the helm. Some backers, however, believed much more than others, 11 of which purchased a $10,000 package offering a tour of Lord British's house, which he called the Britannia Manor, named after a region in the Ultima games. Less insane, five individuals parted with $5,000 each, and 37 individuals threw down $3,000 or $3,500 each to claim a rent-free city plot, and wander the game's world with the one-time available title of Lord, emulating the creator, Lord British himself. Within 30 days of the backing window of Kickstarter, the project, which initially asked for $1 million, managed to raise just over 1.9. This came from a total of 22,332 backers, making it one of the most successful Kickstarter projects of the time, and maybe more importantly, proving a point to the entire industry. Fans were willing to put their money where their mouth is for products that interested them, even without a single slide of gameplay being shown, and there was tens of thousands of people out there who wanted a change in this genre. Throughout the next few years, a lot happened, but before that, we have to address the fortuitous timing of Lord British and his game's arrival. Maybe a coincidence, or maybe a long-term plan. The question remains without answer. The reality, Kickstarter was on a short fuse and it burned quickly. From the first MMORPG funded on the platform in 2012, Pathfinder Online, to March of 2013 when Shroud of the Avatar arrived, there was only a couple MMOs funded on the site. One being Star Citizen, who raised over $2.1 million during their 30-day campaign. Funnily enough, Chris Roberts, the Star Citizen leader, is a personal friend of Richard's and perhaps nudged him in the Kickstarter direction. It seemed like the platform was the new place to fund dreams and projects were raking in millions of dollars for very little to show. This, however, was not going to last. Within a couple of years, the audience learned very hard lessons about crowdfunding through sites such as Kickstarter. One such lesson, MMORPGs cannot be created on a shoestring budget, even if the legendary developers are involved. From Shroud of the Avatar in 2013, enthusiasts funded multiple titles until mid-2015. Those included Camelot Unchained, another spiritual successor to a beloved game called Dark Age of Camelot, Crowfall, which was a spiritual successor to Shadowbane, Chronicles of Valeria, a new title that promised features never before explored, such as permadeath of player characters as a subscription model, and rebirth to new avatars to carry on a family legacy. These games, along with a handful of others, managed to slip into the public eye during a time when nobody knew any better. They climbed the ladder of public funding, and then pulled that ladder up behind them, not due to greed, but due to negligence, malevolence, or incompetence. Over the next few years, each of these games proved to not exist, show little to no progress, or require far more money than they initially stipulated. Star Citizen, for instance, crowdfunded an initial ask of $500,000 in October of 2012, promising a 2014 release date, and they've since raised over $600 million, and despite having a playable alpha version with impressive tech, has not delivered a finished game, let alone the two games that were initially promised. Shroud of the Avatar was never as grand as that, though they did continue to sell backer items and raise money from the public for years to come, considerably more money than they claimed to have needed for a full released game. The initial pitch was $1 million, but by the time full release came, it was in the tens of millions instead. Despite that, Shroud of the Avatar suffered from its own unique problems, problems that became increasingly more pronounced as time went on. Unlike many of the games featured in this video series, however, Shroud of the Avatar did release, but that, like many other games, was just the beginning of the end for Richard's return to glory. Following the end of the Kickstarter on April 7th, 2013, the hype was now real. The community was flourishing, bringing in fans of the Ultima series and newcomers alike. Whether people had played what Richard made all those glorious years ago, or heard about it on forums discussing greater days of gaming, the excitement was clearly visible. The community grew across many social media platforms, and discussions revolved around when Shroud of the Avatar releases, as if it was all but guaranteed. And those fans didn't need to wait for long. 
Unlike his competitors, who were raising millions of dollars with just the promise of a future of brilliant online role-playing games, Richard was keen to deliver his to market first. Just over a year and a half later, Shroud of the Avatar Forsaken Virtues released onto Steam Early Access, taking advantage of the popular avenue of beta release with a price tag to continue their already swelling crowdfunding. To those of you familiar with this video series, you would expect this to be the point I talk about how the review score was mostly negative, that the game was an obvious asset flip mess, which delivered on zero promises and was essentially abject garbage. But maybe this is an exception, as that was not the case. The reviews were largely positive, but there is a story to be told in the reviews themselves. Negative reviews speak of expectation, how players expected an old school game more in line with the classic Ultima Online. What they were delivered was old school in design and implementation, but not for the right reasons. The game was released with dated combat, dated graphics and dated vision, but without the nostalgic feel or hardcore focus that the original fans expected. In fact, the monetization was likely the only modern element of the game to this stage, with the Kickstarter and crowdfunder backing rewards acting like a cash shop to sell the most valuable items in the game, such as city land plots and housing, to those who trusted this vision early. This removed a massive element of the game's ability to appeal to the old school audience. The audience who was the target of Richard to fund the game in the first place. On the other hand, the positive reviews mostly speak of expecting what is to come and how good it was going to be, not of what it currently was. They talked of the foundation for the future, about a trustworthy man with a capable team and the building blocks to create the next great gaming experience. When they did discuss the current game, they said it was buggy, it lacked content, lacked clear vision, and was almost entirely placeholder as a game in Richard's own words. But at least it was playable, it was real, and this set it apart from almost all other Kickstarter projects, let alone MMORPGs. Of course, time would fix these things, these problems that people were talking about. Time would create the game people had paid millions of dollars for. Unfortunately, time also revealed Richard's dream for an altogether different experience from what was initially promised. Moving forward by 2016, the game was in a much better shape in terms of playable content, though still nowhere near close to being a fully released game. The cash shop, however, was coming along real well. Players who missed out on the ground floor of a Kickstarter pledge and looking to own their own land in this ambitious new game were directed to what they called the Crown Store. As Richard said during an interview, quote, to be a property owner, you really need to be in the game for $100 to $150. And this price went through the roof if you wanted to own something luxurious. In fact, the price for a castle was around $12,000 US. That isn't to say you couldn't work towards some of the lower tier housing and land for in-game currency, but the top end stuff was entirely restricted to the pay pigs and pay they did. This was not a new concept in online worlds. Garriott's famed Ultima Online had players selling their prime housing locations on eBay for thousands of dollars all the way back in 1997, but that was against the rules, and this time, Garrett was designing the game around being the dealer of these goods instead. The issue with this being, of course, once a developer is incentivized to sell items within the game, they are also incentivized to design the game to be worse for people who do not purchase said things, and this was exactly the direction that was scaring off the initial hardcore fans who flocked to the project solely because of Lord Rich's involvement. He claimed to be the saviour to return the once hallowed player first experience in the genre, and it was now becoming clear to all that was never going to happen. Instead, it seemed like it was money first. Despite this, development continued and millions of additional funding was pouring in from players who were admittedly enjoying the game thus far, as well as the promise shown for the continuation of progress. The game was of course never incredibly popular in terms of online users, but full release would be expected to fix that. Before then though, the question of bankruptcy loomed in the minds of fans. A website appeared seeking additional funding, presented from Richard Garrett himself, claiming to be selling stakes in the company via a platform called Seed Invest. The first issue was that for Seed Invest to accurately represent the company to potential investors, they needed financial data. Players discovered this data and immediately pointed out the issue. 
despite over $10 million being raised by this stage, the company currently had $528,000 remaining with a monthly burn rate of 230,000, giving them just over two months remaining before the well would run dry and the company would have to cease operation without raising additional funds. With this being the case, perhaps the Steam reviews were wrong and time would not bring them a finished product. Maybe they'd just run out of time instead. Richard Gary immediately went on the press tour speaking to Kotaku and clearing up what he called confusion. The money they were trying to raise was not to prevent bankruptcy, but instead to allow expansion of the company. Portalarium, according to him, always had roughly the same money in the bank and generated enough in revenue each month to essentially remain even. Which could be believed if that was the only issue. However, it wasn't. Instead, keen-eyed fans started to point out that the Seed Invest portal, displaying Shroud of the Avatar to potential investors, was full of, let's say, mistakes. That's a very polite way to put it. Many users pointed out that the pitch displayed technology and features that simply did not exist. Richard also addressed this, though he openly admitted to there being some, what he called, inaccuracies. In essence, this pitch was using incorrect information in order to try to draw in additional funds from a community who had already given more than they should, but luckily this time knew better. At the same time, he was hoping to draw in unsuspecting investors who simply didn't know what they were being sold and how it was partially a little bit of a lie. Richard, of course, told fans not to worry. But what else is he going to say? Everybody panic, we're out of money, and we're gonna have to release the game right now, which they did. Full release arrived on the 27th of March 2018, and this time, I can say that the Steam review score is more in line with what you would expect from Kickstarter to Core, though likely still the best this series is seen to date. It's important to note, this graph with positive to negative reviews is misleading in that the numbers are also incredibly low, which is a much more telling figure than the split of opinions. For this next big thing game that was promised, only around 120 people felt the need to leave reviews. The game peaked out on launch day with 562 players. Less players than on average play random Ultra Online private servers, even though that game released in 1997, and this in 2018. Shroud of the Avatar at this stage had raised easily over $15 million from over 50,000 users, but less than 600 of them were logging into the service concurrently for what was claimed to be the biggest day in the game's history, the full release finally materialising. Unfortunately, this is also where things started to get much, much worse, which shouldn't really have even been possible, as things were already kind of rock bottom for the game and the fans. Richard, however, was keen to explore the unknown as he did previously in life, so at this point, he felt that rock floor beneath him and started to drill down, aiming for the Earth's core instead. Kickstarter physical rewards that had been sold over four years ago were still not fulfilled, no one could get an answer, and the game was still missing promised features from that same Kickstarter pitch. Founders of the company were leaving, such as Dallas Snell, who was there from the very beginning. The company had already faced one round of layoffs just two months after the game had launched. And now the man who was the face and voice of the entire project, Richard himself, stepped down as CEO. Fans of course felt like this was a literal slap in the face for all those who believed in him, those that were fans of his games for up to four decades. It was really a very, very confusing turn of events, especially when Garrett reached out to publication MMORPG.com to inform them that he did not resign and that they as a company had just decided to remove the term executive from all roles, especially considering his was the only one that was ever on the website in the first place and technically all companies are required to have a CEO on paper. Whatever the reason, he now didn't consider himself CEO. This raised many questions. Who was in charge? What could make Lord British give up that role? And how could this be a good direction? But most importantly, what did this mean for the very near future? Fans of the project who had supported it with tens of millions of dollars as a combined effort, mostly due to Richard himself, didn't have to wait very long to get answers to these questions. A few days later, the buy-to-play game lauded as the future of online multiplayer role-playing games announced their transition to a free-to-play model. A surprise to absolutely nobody, and perhaps a chance to draw in some much, much needed fresh blood. Unfortunately, as with almost everything besides raising money from naive fans, 
this did not work. Looking at the Steam data for active players, you wouldn't even know or notice that the game had opened up to hundreds of millions of potential Steam players to flow in for the low, low price of nothing. The free-to-play launch saw the player base gain roughly 50 average players. This, along with the constant mismanagement of expectations, led to the next dose of bad news. Travian Games, Shrouded the Avatar's publisher, dropped the game from their roster, leaving the game entirely without publisher support. Three months later, and a constant decline in fan opinions, Portalarium faced their second round of layoffs. If we remember back, Richard Gary claimed that the Seed Invest portal was to raise money to expand the team. By this stage, there was almost no team left, and just how mismanaged was this whole project, as they were now firmly in the death spiral. If they couldn't stem the bleeding while having more staff and a publisher, what could they hope to do after losing both? But that strangely wasn't even the worst part. When Portalarium upsold their game's features in order to raise funding with actual shares of the business, these people who purchased them were official investors, which should have afforded them protections, as well as access to financial records and reports. After all, they apparently now owned percentages of the company. According to these investors, however, they were being stonewalled, or more accurately, ignored entirely. Multiple investors were in contact with the Seed Invest platform, and Seed Invest were constantly reaching out to Portalarium. But there was no response, as well as there were absolutely no financial records being disclosed at all. These people, who by law should have been involved, were as much in the dark as the original Kickstarter backers, who had absolutely no protections at all. And it wasn't just investors or players who were left without light. The Securities and Exchange Commission also failed to receive a report from Richard Garrett's Portalarium. Somewhere around this time, the company also closed their physical offices, claiming that this was just a temporary move. But as you could guess, it was not temporary. In fact, Portalarium announced a few months later that they had sold the entirety of the company, the game, and assets to a brand new company called Catnip Games. Fans quickly searched the internet to find who Catnip Games was, and they discovered something strange. Chris Spears, who was the previous president of Portalarium alongside Lord British's leadership, was the CEO of Catnip. A very confusing turn of events, essentially completely removing Richard Garriott's business from the equation, despite it existing solely due to his own involvement. From there, it would be getting into the weeds to continue discussing Shroud of the Avatar, as the game has floundered without massive developments, although seeing some updates, and exists almost entirely for the disgruntled fans to make fun of, or question what happened during each subsequent controversy. Fans did, however, get some answers as to where Richard Garrett had gone after wasting their money and abandoning them. He went to the same place as other once legend, but now fallen from grace game developers from beloved days gone by, straight to the blockchain. In August of 2022, fans discovered, without surprise but with disgust, that Richard was developing an NFT cryptocurrency game. The title was revealed as Iron and Magic. Luckily, as I write this video almost a year later, Iron and Magic has mysteriously vanished, much like Richard's involvement in the future of online role-playing games and the respect of his longtime fans. Catnip Games and Chris Spears claim Shroud of the Avatar is still being fully supported and will be going nowhere, but anyone familiar with the project should probably know better. The game will continue to go where it has been going since the initial early access release in 2014, and that is down. Down further and further until it is closed for good. After all, it's impossible to trust the word of people who have repeatedly proven themselves untrustworthy. Many legendary game designers and developers find themselves exactly where Richard Garriott now exists. Time and time again, they tarnish their legacy by trying to relive past glory and prove either to their fans or to themselves that they still have what it takes to roll back the years and change history again. Rarely, if ever, does this go to plan. The most often result is a headline that makes gamers collectively groan in unison, typically with the once greats of the industry dipping their toes into the sewer that is blockchain gaming, chasing the trend of what outwardly looks like greed or vanity. Hopefully Richard leaves his legacy alone from now and goes back to being remembered as the pioneer of the RPG and the MMORPG genres. But the last game in his legacy 
will go down as an abject failure, a game that has no right to really exist, as it was willed into existence on reputation alone. Sky-high expectations, which delivered nothing but disappointment, limping along now, exhausted, pretending that things are okay, waiting to be put to rest, just like its creator's legacy, hopefully never to be seen again. 